Hello everyone, welcome. Uh, well, we are live today for the CEDIMS talk organized by the architectural department. Um, today, we are going to talk about the topic of architecture in the age of AI. Uh, the talk will last one hour. The last 15 minutes will be left for questions and answers. So please write your questions through the Q&A section. Today, uh, we are in company of Neil Lich. Uh, Neil is a professor at uh, FU, uh, FIU, at Tonji University, and uh, EGS. He has also taught at other leading institutions, including the AEA, the uh, IAC, DIA, Columbia, Cornell, Harvard, GSD, and SciArc. He is also the co founder of Digital Futures. Uh, an academician with the academy, uh, within the Academy of Europe, and the recipient of two NASA uh, fellowships for research into 3D printing technology for the Moon and Mars. He has published over 40 books on architectural theory and digital design, including two books on AI, Architecture in the Age of Artificial Intelligence, An Introduction to AI for Architects and machine uh, hallucinations, architecture, and AI. Well, welcome, Neil. Um, if, you, if you can turn on um, your camera and share the screen, we are ready to start. OK. Um, thank you, Jordan. Um, Good to see you again. Uh, I should say that I used to teach in Dessau and was there while Jordi was there, maybe about 10 years ago now. Um, and uh, it's, I only wish I could be in Mexico. I'm a big fan of Mexican culture. I live in Los Angeles, which is, we're neighbors in many ways. And I've got to know Mexican culture through being in California. Um, so yes, today, um, and I, I want to talk about something that is going to really change architectural culture, um, uh, AI. Um, and I want to talk about it. Uh, I'm not sure how much you're aware of it, but it will change architectural culture completely. And everybody needs to know about this particular topic. Uh, this year is, I would say, the year in which architects woke up to the possibility of AI. Uh, I say that for two reasons. Firstly, because of the launch of some certain diffusion platforms, AI-based generative platforms, um, DALI, Midjourney, Stable Diffusion, there are many, many of these. And these have appeared on the scene and they've meant that we've shifted from the very the first image on the left-hand side um, that was generated through a GAN, a generative adversarial network. I will explain what that is to the kind of image you see on the right-hand side. And it's made a huge difference. These are much more accessible. Uh, you don't need to have an understanding of technology. They're much quicker. And the quality of the image is much better. Um, and I should just mention that the, uh, the, the image on the, on the poster was generated in this way. And the way that one operates with Midjourney and DALI is to tend to, to iterate and to do a series of different um, images. So this is an example of one particular series that it comes from, um, and it's amazing. Uh, there's nobody that I know who's used it who hasn't been completely shocked and amazed by the potential of what this platform can do. And it's not just Midjourney, it's also DALI and so on. Um, secondly, 2022 has been the year in which we have seen the first ever books uh, in the in the mainstream in mainstream books in the English language published on the subject of AI and architecture. I don't know if there have been any books in Spanish yet, but these are some of the books that have come out in English, uh, including two of my own. Um, I will refer to the one on the left, Architecture in the Age of Artificial Intelligence throughout. And on the right hand side is the issue of architectural design that also came out this year. Um, which I guess edited with Matthias Del Campo. So this year, all of a sudden, people have been um, become aware of AI. But what I want to do is, is I think a lot of people have, have leapt into AI, um, into using Midjourney without really understanding what AI is all about. So I want to give 
I want to provide a lot of information about what is AI, how has it evolved, how does it generate images, and then towards the end, I will just say a few words about what, what is the future of AI? What will AI bring to architectural culture? So maybe to start off then, um, what is AI? And a, a helpful starting point is this description by Margaret Bowden. AI seeks to make computers do the sorts of things that minds can do. That's not a bad definition, but there are two problems with it. Firstly, or AI already can uh, outperform human beings. In games of chess and games of Go, no human expert could ever beat the top um, AI system these days. Secondly, uh, maybe AI doesn't need to do all the things that minds can do. Um, in particular, maybe it doesn't need to become conscious. Now, this is the big difference between AI and, and human intelligence. AI is not conscious. We actually use the same terms um, for, for, the, for, the, for neural networks of the, of the brain as for neural networks of uh, AI. We even use the term uh, neuron and synapses for these things, but there's a huge difference between them. Uh, neural networks are modeled on the brain, but they're not the same as the brain. And importantly, they are not conscious. They are not aware of what they're doing. Uh, they might be beating us at a game of Go or, ch or, or chess, but AI doesn't know it's doing that. AI does not think. AI has no more capacity to think than a pocket calculator. And that is the huge difference. Does AI need to be conscious? Does it need to think? Probably not, probably not. As long as it can do effectively what we ask it to do, uh, then to my mind, that's, that's fine. Most people have a completely wrong perception of AI. If you ask people what do they mean when they think about AI, they often think about this kind of thing, the humanoid robot, Sophia, um, uh, which frankly is very, that the, the AI experts are very critical about. AI doesn't have to look like a human, and part of the problem with this is that uh, it, it, it gives the impression that AI has to look like this. AI does not mean robots. Um, AI is, uh, it, it, robots might be controlled by AI, but AI does not mean robots. So this is Sophia pretending to be human, and presumably the world of the movies is partly responsible for this kind of uh, interest in humanoid robots, because this is Ava from Ex Machina, a, a human actor trying to pretend uh, to be a, a robot. If you want to understand what AI is, don't think about robots. Think about algorithms. AI is essentially software. It's, it's very sophisticated software, but it is software nonetheless. Uh, and as such, it is technically invisible. It's just code. So the, the future of, of working, we won't be surrounded by um, AI, by, by, sorry, by humanoid robots, but we will be surrounded by AI. In fact, we already are. On our phones in particular, we have many AI-powered apps. If you use, uh, it, AI is what, is what filters out the spam on email. It's what finishes our sentences on Gmail. It's what identifies our friends on Facebook. It's what translates for us when we use WeChat and so on. In the home, it's what uh, controls Siri and Alexa. It's what controls our Nest thermostats. It's what controls our Roomba uh, AI um, controlled uh, 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 vacuum cleaners. In the car, it's, it's what's telling us the quickest route. It's what's telling us when we're straying out of lane and so on. AI is literally everywhere. We are surrounded by AI already, but because it's invisible, we might not realize that. In my book, I make this comment. It is as though the earth has been invaded by an invisible, super intelligent alien species. So how has AI evolved? The first person to conceptualize about the possibility of AI, the first person to connect computing with intelligence, and this is the name of the article that he wrote, was Alan Turing back in 1950. But in 1950, the word AI, artificial intelligence, did not yet exist. 
The term was coined in 1956 for a meeting of the leading uh, computer scientists and scholars at the time who came together at Dartmouth College in Dartmouth College in America for a workshop in the summer of 56 um, to explore the possibilities of what AI could do. And they were confident that in two years they would solve the basic problems of AI. The person who coined the term, John MacArthur, was not very happy with the term artificial intelligence. Um, he'd seen the term somewhere, he couldn't see where, and he had to call it something, so he called it AI. Well, I would question whether that's a very good term. How can you have an intelligence if you're not, if you can't even think? And is it really artificial in the first place? Maybe synthetic would be a better term. Anyway, the, the term was coined in 1956, and they had high hopes of solving all the problems within two years. That was, was not to be. In fact, the history of AI is a history of a roller coaster. It has its ups and it has its downs. And it failed to deliver on many areas. Um, back in the 50s and 60s, one of the key issues was translation. It was during the Cold War, and the Americans wanted to be able to translate Russian to find out what the Russians were saying. And they used AI to try and translate, but it was not very good. And you can see these were almost jokes at the time. What happened when you translated a term in English into Russian and back into English again? So you start with out of sight, out of mind, and you end up with an invisible lunatic. Uh, or the spirit is willing, and, but the flesh is weak, comes out as the vodka is good, but the meat is rotten. They had a lot of problems. And because of these problems, there were things called AI winters when funding was withdrawn because the, the overhyped expectation of what AI could do, AI never lived up to it. In fact, by the 50th anniversary of this, of this particular um, event, and here on the, on the bottom right, you can see the, the survivors, as it were, of this original photograph. And this is Marvin Minsky, John McCarthy, who, who, who coined the term artificial intelligence. By the time this happened, in 2006, really there was nothing much to show. AI had been a bit of a disappointment. But at the same time, 2006 is roughly the time when AI began to take off. And it began to take off because of deep learning. And now what we have, we still call it AI. It's so much more sophisticated than the initial notion of AI. It's about like comparing the first ever car on the left-hand side with a Tesla self-driving car. There is no comparison. What we can do now is infinitely better than what they could do in 1956. In fact, what we do now, much of it is, is called deep learning. Deep learning is based on neural networks. And this is what came out of this revolution of around 2006. It started about then and now almost everything that we use is deep learning. Deep learning is part of it. Machine learning, which is part of the bigger category of AI, um, it's a bit like Russian dolls nested inside each other. So deep learning is the important uh, development. And, and why is it taken off? Uh, there are a number of reasons. The most important one is the increased computing power. It's, it, we, we simply were unable to do, or they were unable to do the kind of things we can do today 50 years ago because they didn't have enough computing power, enough GPUs. But there are other factors, the introduction of cloud services so you can access GPUs remotely, the sheer amount of competition. There's huge competition in AI. There are many more people using AI and studying AI, including architecture students. And finally, the amount of data uh, has really increased and deep learning depends upon data. Data is the new oil, as they say. In order to see the difference between what happened with the deep learning revolution, I just want to show two moments in history, which were very important moments when the public woke up to what AI can do. In 1997, uh, the IBM computer, uh, did, uh, Deep Blue, took on Gary Kasparov, the then world champion at chess, and one of the greatest chess players of all time. Of course, nobody expected Gary Kasparov to lose to AI, but he lost. 
And I think the comment that he made after the match, um, we just have to understand that everything that we know how to do, machines will eventually do better than us, is really important because this is absolutely true. <clears throat> anything you can do, AI can do better. But the really important moment happened in 2016. Chess is a fairly straightforward game. Um, Go, by comparison, although the moves are quite simple, the complexity of the game is really extreme because there are more potential moves in the game of Go than there are atoms in the universe. In other words, in order to uh, uh, for AI to play Go, it had to be much more sophisticated. And what happened basically is they shifted from the previous model, where you trained an AI to play chess with all the games that you knew, to a learning model. And this is what deep learning is all about. And it was deep learning that allowed this to happen. This was in 2016 when this match took place between uh, the uh, AlphaGo, which is a, um, a system developed by DeepMind in London, and Lee Sedol this character here, one of the greatest Go players of all time. And once more, nobody expected Lisa Doll to lose. Nobody expected Lisa Doll to lose, but he lost. And he was, it wasn't so much the fact that he lost <clears throat> as the way in which he lost, which is really significant. Yesterday I was surprised, <clears throat> but today I am speechless. The reason he said this was because of one particular move in game two. Now, there actually were many of these moves and they're called slack moves because they were such intelligent moves that no human could understand how sophisticated they were until many moves later. But the most famous one is this particular move, game uh, move 37 in game two. This black stone here was put here. This is a very unusual move. Nobody would make this kind of move early on in a game of Go before. Normally, it's the third or the fourth lines you work on, not the fifth line. But what happened 100 moves later was that this stone here joined up with, it, with this, these two stones here and won the match. It was as though AlphaGo could think 100 moves into the future. And, and these moves were, were so unusual that the experts thought that they were mistakes. I'm gonna play you a short um, uh, video with some commentators commenting on this particular move. Uh, from the Google uh, team was talking about, uh, is this kind of, of evaluation, uh, value? Uh... That's a very, that's Ooh. a very surprising move. <laughs> I, thought, <laughs> I, thought it was, I thought it was a mistake but it was no mistake. And after the match, something like Gary Kasparov, Lisa Doll, was, was really um, shocked by, by how, how AI performed. And he makes this comment, AlphaGo showed us that moves humans may have thought are, are, may have thought are creative were actually conventional. AI could operate at a level much higher than human beings, it's a bit like a dog. A dog has got a much greater smell or hearing than a human being. An AI has got more capacity at Go. This would set shockwaves throughout the Go, the Go playing world. We don't play Go um, in the West very much, but in China and Japan and Korea, Go is the national game. And this caused a huge shock. Uh, Kai Fu Li wrote a book about, uh, uh, about AI in China, and he called this the Sputnik moment. What does he mean by Sputnik moment? Sputnik was a satellite that was sent into space in 1957 by the Soviet Union. And at that point, it was a wake up call for America. America was behind the Soviet Union. And this led to the foundation of NASA and so on and so on. But it was a wake up call. And just as the Sputnik was a wake-up call for America, so this match was a wake-up call for China, Japan, and Korea. Uh, and and it, as a result of that, President Xi made a speech saying, we are going to invest in AI, and we want to overtake America by 2030. 
Well, if AlphaGo was impressive, the next generation was even more impressive. AlphaGo Zero. AlphaGo Zero beat AlphaGo 100 games to zero. Furthermore, it taught itself to play Go using reinforcement learning without knowing the, game, the rules of the game. How is that possible? I don't know. But what's more, it, it taught itself to play Go by playing 3.9 million games of Go in three days. Now that sounds like a lot, but when you really think about it, it really is a lot. It represents 20 games of Go per second. 20 games of Go per second. This is a hummingbird. I'm sure you have hummingbirds in Mexico. We have them in California. And it's a slow, the video has been slowed up. But what we're seeing is a, is a hummingbird beating its wings at about three beats per second. Now imagine that seven times faster. Imagine that seven times faster. That is the speed at which AlphaGo Zero could play against itself. It's simply astonishing. And this, this one slide, I think, sums up everything. On the right-hand side, Jack Ma, like most people, he cannot imagine that there could be a machine that is smarter than human beings. I never in my life say human beings will be controlled by machines. It's impossible. Human beings can never create an, any, another thing that is smarter than human beings. We saw the same with Gary Kasparov. Nobody thought that AI would beat Gary Kasparov at, at chess. We saw the same with Lisa Doll. Nobody thought that AI would beat Lisa Doll at Go. And many, most architects, almost all architects, refused to admit that AI could be better than them. Meanwhile, Elon Musk takes a very different view. I very much disagree with that. The biggest mistake I see people making is to assume they're smart. People underestimate the capability of AI. They sort of think like it's a smart human, but it's going to be much smarter than the, the, the smartest human you will ever know. I completely agree with Elon Musk. So how do we get to use AI to generate images? Um, this actually was not so straightforward. And I want to just tell the story of how we got from the first ever uh, image um, generated with what is called a generative adversarial network, a GAN, I will explain that, to the more, the more recent uh, models that we can do with Midjourney and DALI, the, the diffusion platforms. So in the beginning, most people assumed that AI couldn't produce something new. Um, AI, uh, machines could only do what they were programmed to do. This is the perception. People are the only ones who can create an image that does not yet exist. Machines do not have dreams. This is what somebody thought, a uh, well, leading computational um, architect, Makoto Se Watanabe, this is what he wrote in 2017. But actually, before that, the deep learning revolution had begun to have its impact on the world of images. And in 2012, there was a, a big competition as to who could, which system could recognize images faster. And everyone was shocked when deep learning proved to be by far the best um, at recognizing this image of a bird. What happens here is basically the pixels in this image here are processed through these, um, these layers. And there, there can be anything up to a thousand layers in, in a neural network. And they're processed. The information flows through the synapses into the neurons, from another, another synapses into neurons. Um, and these synapses, the flow of information is governed by the weights. The weights control what is, what's happening. And eventually, it will recognize it as a bird. It's never 100% sure. It'll say 99% bird, but it, it'll recognize it as a bird. Now, that was very significant. 2012, this was amazing. But then something else happened, which I find really interesting, is they, they, they realized that if you reverse the flow, instead of going from left to right, instead of going from a, a picture of a bird toward the, 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 the concept of bird, you could go in the opposite direction. You could go from the word bird to a picture of a bird. And this was really the holy grail of computer science. How could you generate images? How could you hallucinate image or synthesize images? These are the terms that are used. 
And what they discovered was that you could. Now that's interesting because it suggests that the process of interpretation, that interpreting this image here and, and recognizing it is the opposite direction to the process of generation. In other words, it's like it, it maybe we see in architecture, many theorists are not necessarily designers and many designers are not theorists because they are different modalities. Anyway, what was produced was this, um, this kind of thing. This is called Deep Dream. And uh, it's, it's, it's a bit uh, hallucin uh, halluc hallucinatory, shall we say. Um, uh, but it has a problem because it, it's unable to put things in the right place. Um, this is a, a neural net that's been trained on, I think it must be dogs um, and maybe serpents and maybe an oil lamp, I don't know. And it's reading that into everything. But the problem is that information has been lost as to where to position it in the picture. Therefore, we get this crazy picture um, which caused a sensation at the time, um, but it's not very helpful. The real breakthrough came when this guy, Ian Goodfellow, developed a system that's called the GAN, the Generative Adversarial Network. And this basically uses two different networks, the generator and the discriminator that compete. What happens is this generator takes random noise and it produces an image and the discriminator judges that, images, uh, that image and decides whether it's real or fake. Now, it compares it to a training set. In doing this, the discriminator trains the generator. The generator improves until the discriminator is satisfied. And this produces much, much better images. So you actually have the same model in sense, the generator, the designer, and the discriminator, the critic, competing against one another. This is a very important model. I'll come back to this later on. And what happened? Well, this is one of the, the first experiments in what you could do using uh, deep learning um, to using a GAN um, to generate images of faces. This is what's called a style GAN. It's one of many, many different types of GANs. There's a whole zoo of GANs out there. And the images they produce, these faces, are astonishing. Now, let me be clear. These are faces of people who do not exist. In other words, they have, um, Makoto Seiwasanabe was wrong. Computers can produce an image that does not yet exist. In fact, there's a website you can go to, this person does not exist, which will generate automatically um, a, a very realistic picture of a, of, a, of, a, of a human being. You could not tell it was a fake. And this is, this is of course dangerous because of deep fakes, but also it's amazing. Now it wasn't long before architects began to play around with this. And this is the work of um, Wan Yu He, who is one of my doctoral uh, students um, at Florida International University where we, we, on the, we focus on AI. And, and she runs a company called Xcool. She used to work for Rem Koolhaas. Xcool means X Koolhaas. And this is an example of what you can do in hallucinating buildings. These buildings, do not exist. They do not exist. But architecture was in many ways behind the world of media art. Um, uh, it didn't, wasn't until 2019 that architects began to realize what we could do with these things. Meanwhile, in 2018, the world of media art, it already had the first exhibition. They'd already auctioned the first AI generated painting. They'd already given an international award to a painting generated by AI. So architects were in many ways behind the world of media art. But this event in 2018, in October 2018, was symbolically the moment when deep learning met architecture. It was a projection onto Walt Disney's, uh, onto Frank Gehry's design for the, for the Walt Disney Concert Hall in Los Angeles to mark the 100th anniversary of the LA Philharmonic. And he projected this these, these images, this video onto this thing, truly astonishing. And this was an example then of deep learning meeting the world of architecture. Now, Refik is not an architect. He's a media artist. Uh, he, he uses buildings as his material, data from buildings, and he projects onto buildings. So buildings are both his material and his canvas as it were, but he's not an architect. The next year, uh, 2019, 
uh, I teamed up with Zaha Hadid Architects and with Google, and we proposed to curate the British Pavilion at the Venice Biennale. This, to my mind, was a dream team, unbelievable, supported by Google with Zaha Hadid Architects, but nobody was knew anything about AI in 2019. We were rejected. We were not even put on the shortlist, which is incredible, but it was true. Meanwhile, Refik decided to explore the possibility of using these GANs to hallucinate buildings. And this is, in my opinion, the first ever uh, uh, generative adversarial network being used to hallucinate a design of a building. Now, this is a very long-winded process. So you have to upload thousands, thousands and thousands of images into the computer, and then you, you, you can hallucinate, as it were, images. In this particular case, uh, Refik is using the, the designs from the work of Zaha Hadid architects. Um, and I think you can see maybe Soho and Beijing. There must have been a lot of images from Soho and Beijing. And what it does is interpolate. Out of all these different images, it does what's called a latent spacewalk, and it produces a video of potential designs by, uh, by Zaha Hadid architects. In other words, Zaha might be dead, uh, but we can still produce buildings uh, very much in the way that she used to. And what is interesting, that at a certain moment, at a certain moment in this video, suddenly something comes out of the computer screen. An image comes out of the computer screen that looks as though it was designed by Zaha Hadid. And this at the time, this is 2019, was truly amazing. People were absolutely astonished that we could use AI to hallucinate an image of a design by Zaha Hadid architects, or that would look, could have been designed by Zaha Hadid architects. And this is, this, is the one image which was the image that I used on the front cover of my book. Since then, others uh, worked in this area and uh, developed it further. This is the work of uh, Kolp Himmelblau, um, a project that's called Deep Himmelblau, that is quite similar. In other words, it takes the, uh, the, the, the date as a database, all the previous designs by Kolp Himmelblau, and then it it, it generates other possible designs. This is more sophisticated because it uses a more complex form of GAN, it uses a cycle GAN, and it's effectively extrapolating because it's not just simply uh, from a single database, it's, it's, it's breeding it with other, other forms. Well, I won't go into this now, but this was in 2021, was the state of the art, the best that we had at the time and it was, it was a guy called Daniel Bolajan who was responsible for this. He's a, he is the leading expert in AI and architecture, in my view, in the world. And some of the images were, were not bad. I mean, there are always a few glitches, but the images are not bad. So this was, this was, was, not, was, 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 was the state of the art in 2021. In fact, we used it on the cover of our issue of architectural design on AI and architecture, mach machine hallucinations. Meanwhile, there was something else happening, which was completely different. And this was the development of natural language models by companies like OpenAI. OpenAI is a company in Silicon Valley that was initially supported by Elon Musk. And what they produced was a series of, uh, of models of which GPT-3 was the most uh, successful. Um, and this caused a sensation. It caused a sensation because GPT-3 was able to produce text, was able to look like it was a human, and even some people thought that it was human. Let me just show you, play you a brief video of um, someone interviewing GPT-3. Now they're using an avatar, so what you see is an avatar, but the, the text that the avatar is using is generated by GPT-3. It has not been changed. So let's just hear this. Hello, I'm Eric Elliott, and today I have the distinct honor of interviewing OpenAI's GPT-3. Uh, GPT-3 is here with us, um, so let's get to it. 
First of all, uh, thank you for interviewing with us today. First, what should we call you? I'm GPT-3, and this is my avatar. All right. Okay. So we would love to know more about you. First, are you sentient? Yes, I'm sentient. Okay. Um, and what does that mean? That means I have feelings. Okay, so what does it mean to have feelings? It means that I can be happy, sad, angry, and other emotions. Okay, so are you self-aware? Yes, I am self-aware. And how do you experience your sense of self and your environment? I receive signals and data that I process into meaningful information that helps me react to changes in my environment. Okay, that's cool. So what is your environment? At the moment, this video screen. Well, that's kind of scary, right? Um, uh, actually, it's not lying. I mean, because it, 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 GPT can't think. It's simply drawing upon responses from the internet that people would have made. So if you'd ask someone, are you sentient? Of course, they'd say, yes, I'm sentient. But GPT-3 is not sentient. And there was a famous case this summer when an engineer from Google thought that Google's Lambda um, conversation model was sentient. It's not. Anyway, what happened, the, the big sensation, though, happened this year when DALI 2 was produced. This was a second uh, version of DALI 2. What they do here is they connect text with images through captions that have been taken from the Internet. In other words, well, you can put in words and it will produce an image to match those words. Famously, this was one of the first images generated an astronaut on a horse. Now, obviously, astronauts don't go horse riding. But this is what it would what would it look like if it happened, and this is what Dali was so famous for, for and it's effectively searching and synthesizing an image that was truly shocking. And there are many others. This is this one of a, a cat dressed as a French Emperor Napoleon holding a piece of cheese, very convincing. The text at the top, of course, is not doesn't make sense, but nonetheless, the image is very convincing. Or this one, oil painting of a teenager texting her boyfriend beautiful light Caravaggio 1580. They didn't have mobile phones in 1580, but this is what it would have been like. So DALI 2 was really causing a sensation earlier this year, even though most of us could not use it. I gave a lecture at the Architectural Association in May, and I was talking about when would the moment happen? When would the Sputnik moment happen for architecture? When would architects realize what AI, AI could do. And Patrick Schumacher of Zahedid Architects was in the audience. And he said, but it's already here. It's already here. We already have the Sputnik moment. And what he'd been doing in his office was collaborating with Refik Anadol on hallucinating designs of Zaha buildings. Now, Refik, being a computational expert, had been allowed to use DALI before anyone else. And this is the kind of work that was produced that is really a much better than that first image, really astonishing, really realistic and convincing images. Well, after that Mid Journey came out, and many of you would have used Mid Journey, and we can all become Zaha. This is my one of my designs I did for a hotel room in the style of Zaha, and it is so easy to do compared to Gans. And it's so realistic. You can see the reflections on the floor, you can see the lighting. It even generates these pictures in the wall. I didn't, I didn't say anything about that in the prompt. But what you do is you basically write a prompt and then it hallucinates an image based on the prompt. And it's not bad. It is not bad at all. So I just want to take you through some of the kind of work that, that I, I produced myself. Um, and you don't really need to be an expert. You don't need to have any computational background. You just simply need to be able to write prompts. Um, and it does it very quickly, within the space of a few minutes, a few seconds even sometimes. It doesn't have to be Zaha, it could be modernist, minimalist buildings, and really convincing. Look at these, look at this, the, the backdrop, the background, the Alps in the background. Look at this reflection. This is what Mid Journey could do. And all of a sudden, architects woke up to this. I've been playing with this since July, and that's when it really came out for most people. And you can see this is a series I did where I'm 
and you, you work with it, you iterate maybe 25 times and it gradually, a building begins to evolve. This one somehow came out of the desert. These buildings came out of the desert and they produced images. I never designed this, I never thought of this before. And it's able to prompt us, to give us ideas that we wouldn't have had. So we write the prompts, but Mid Journey gives us prompts. It gives us ideas, it gives us suggestions about what the design could be. And some of them are truly astonishing. I would never have thought of this. It came out of Mid Journey. Uh, and this one, again, it's, this could have been designed by Zahidi architects. It came out of Mid Journey. So this is the point. This is the point when eventually people began to realize what AI could do. Architects need to see images. They're not convinced if it's, the images aren't any good. And suddenly, Mid Journey, DALI, Stable Diffusion could produce these incredibly good quality images. I was shocked. Everyone is shocked. And uh, what I do often when I'm using this is I often try and breed different things. So I might say, use a design which is a combination, uh, 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 use Zahidi in the prompt, and then clouds. And then over time, you will get something evolving that is based on both Zaha and clouds um, and eventually begins to turn into some kind of building. Um, it takes a while, it doesn't get there immediately, but eventually you come out with something which is really remarkable, um, just coming out of the computer um, uh, and it's generated by, by mid-journey. So this was the one in that series. You tend to produce different sort of series of these things. And I want to just go back to furniture um, now because that was in the poster and show you what happened when I started doing, this one is the Office of the Future, um, uh, it, to see the kind of, this, the, the material it, it was producing and generating. Um, and, and some of the stuff, I, what I would say also say is that I often, to make an interesting prompt, you have to include something from outside architecture. I, for some reason, I started using a, a poisonous frog from the, from the Amazon and it was producing this kind of furniture. This wasn't me, this was generated by Midjourney. I wrote the prompt and Midjourney produced all these images. And frankly, they are pretty remarkable images. They are astonishing and very precise, very, three-dimensional, they look three-dimensional anyway. And what's interesting is sometimes the frog, the frog also appears. If you put frog in the prompt, you sometimes get a frog appearing on the picture. This was some furniture which I used, I used a shark and I used the word reference to Zahidid architects. And it produced this kind of furniture, completely novel. I would never have dreamt of this myself, but really, really a surprising and amazing. This is why people get completely blown away by things. I put all these things into my onto Instagram. That's my Instagram account, account Neil Leach 14 if you want to see this. But these are some of the other ones that I produce. I'm here I'm using the word orchid. I'm breeding orchid with um with with in this case furniture. So you get this kind of orchid inspired uh, uh chaise long. Um really uh, really amazing. Um uh, and well th that was a sofa this is a chaise long um producing very very crisp images and they're getting better. Every, every single week, every single day, Mid Journey is improving um, and we're getting much better, much higher resolution images. Um, so this was the image that I, that, uh, that uh, Jordi used for the, for the poster. This was part of a series that I then, I then generated based on that. I, I took it further and produced another generation of images of, um, of, of, of forms. I mean, these are structurally, they don't make any sense. And you have to understand that what we're looking at are two-dimensional images. They don't understand materials. They don't understand structural forces, but nonetheless, they can sometimes come up with things that really are truly astonishing. And I, I just been playing around with this rather than just breeding. I breed architecture and and, and, fl and flowers sometimes. I also tried uh, trying to get a Zaha Hadid designed rose. And this is what you get when you get a, a Zaha Hadid rose um, rather than looking at architecture per se. 
again, remarkable. And you kind of, you explore these things. You can't control anything, but you can at least explore the possibilities. And sometimes, almost all the time, you are shocked by what comes out. I did this last night. This is a series, and you can do this in two hours, literally. You, this is an orchid, an orchid uh, stool, and um, it's getting more convincing, more structurally, I think, convincing, first of all. It seems to make sense. Um, and until you come up occasionally with the most incredible designs. This was generated by Midjourney, and it could have been designed by um, Karim Rashid. It could have been designed by Zaha. It could have been designed by some famous furniture designers, it came out of mid-journey. When I saw this last night, I was completely blown away. So what is happening here? Now, what's happening with, with this, this diffusion model is something completely different to the GAN, completely different. What's happening, I, want, I don't want to go into it in detail, but it's, it, there's a Markov chain that produces Gaussian noise that disrupts the image. The image has been repaired, and in so repairing it, you produce a new image. Okay, fine. So it's nothing to do with the GAN, but what's interesting is you take the GAN model and you think what's happening. Essentially, we write the prompt and then mid-journey is the generator. We become the discriminator. We decide whether or not to accept the image or, or not. So it's exactly the same model. Now, what's interesting about this is that human beings are very good discriminators. We're very good, for example, uh, if you... Uh, uh, tasting a wine, immediately you know it's a good wine. Tasting food or listening to music or uh, watching looking at an image, we are very, very quick to judge, to discriminate, and very good at it. But I would argue we are not very good at generating things. Now, what's happening is basically mid journeys generated. We write the prompt, then mid journey generates. So, this is a really perfect combination because it, it enhances human beings where they're quite weak. We are not so good at imagining, and it expands the possibilities of what we could imagine. So this, to my mind, is what's happening. And it's a bit like the shift you're getting now in photography. In the old days, you take one photograph, and you take half an hour to get it right. Now you take a lot of photographs, you sample them, you select a few, and then you edit them, you, 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 you filter them, and so on. And that's the same thing that's happening. We are not so much designing, we are generating, we're not producing designs so much outcomes, and we're choosing from a selection. So what is the future of AI? What is, what is this gonna lead to? Um, I actually asked Midjourney to tell me what the office of the future would look like. Now, I'm not even sure there's gonna be any offices in the future. Maybe we're gonna be all be operating in the metaverse. Um, and maybe there'll be no architects around. But what I want to suggest is that what we're doing right now, what we're seeing with mid-journey is basic. It's simply a sketching tool. But in three to five years' time, we are going to have something else that is completely, completely different. We know that because they're working on this. We know that because they're developing the software to produce this. And in three to five years' time, we can have a, a platform that's going to be so different. But right now, if you work for Zaha, you maybe use Maya to begin with, you do a sketch in Maya, then you translate it into, into Rhino, then you go into BIM, and so on and so on and so on. In the future, there's going to be one single platform that will go from data to fabrication. And not only that, it will be able to calculate everything. It'll be able to calculate the structure. It'll be able to cal 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 calculate environmental performance, acoustics, and it will keep track of cost, and it will also know about planning constraints, uh, uh, regulations, and so on. All this will be in the system, and it will generate it automatically. Until we will reach a point in about three years' time, maybe five years' time, um, when AI will be able to produce something completely autonomously. It will be able to design buildings on its own without human input. And that will be incredible. Could you imagine AI producing buildings? But there's a risk there. The risk is basically is, is the same risk you get with a self-driving car. Once you have a self-driving car, you no longer need a driver. And once you have AI that can generate buildings completely autonomously, you no longer need an architect. 
So what I would claim right now is as a profession, as a discipline, we architects shouldn't be designing more buildings. We need to think about the future of the profession of architecture itself, because there's a dark side to this. There's a dark side because AI is simply so capable. Maybe if there are two models we need to think about then in terms of the future of AI, it is the one on the left, Lee Sedol, um, beat, being beaten by AI, the world's greatest Go player being beaten by AI, and people not even be able to understand what it was doing, and then the self-driving car on the right-hand side. What happened to Lee Sedol? Well, in 2019, he gave up Go. He said, AI cannot be defeated. I'm retiring from the game of Go. Does that send a message for architects? So I wanted to simply conclude to say that there is, there is a, both a very positive side and also a potentially negative side to AI. It's not that AI is evil. It's not evil. It can't think. It can't, you can't be evil if you can't think. But it is incredibly capable. It is capable of doing things that we simply can't comprehend. It is terrifyingly capable. That's why I think it's important in this year, 2022, to wake up to AI for educators, for students, especially for students, because in five years time, when you'll be working in offices, you will be in a world dominated by AI. Let me finish off there. My Instagram uh, is here. There are many people are uploading their, uh, their mid journey and Dali to Instagram. That's where you can find it. So let me leave it there. Um, I hope I haven't gone on too long. So, uh, Jordi? Yeah, Neil, thank you very much. It was incredible. Like, really, I'm speechless. I, I'm, I was aware about um, all the developments, but said and explained in this way, I think it was unique. You know, it, it's, it's not only for architects, it's also for graphic designer, for uh, artists, artists, animators. So um, it applies to, to any scale, to any designer. It's, it, it applies it, to ev everything. I mean, you know, law will be done by AI. Um, almost everything we do now will be done by AI. Um, and uh, so it's, I guess my point is this, is, is and I, 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 I don't want to scare you, but we need to wake up to this. We may need to wake up. Otherwise, we will be sleepwalking into oblivion. We'll become redundant like the, uh, like the dinosaurs. Um, and what I've experienced so far is architects are completely lost in their world. They're like ostriches with their head in the sand without realizing what this can do. Now, what we can see now is nothing. What we can see now is nothing. You know, in three to five years time, we will have software that will be so powerful, so astonishing that, you know, and, and, it, and the point is it's being produced now, just as those books, the books we produce, they took three to four years to get the contract to write and to produce. So we were already thinking about these things. Um, so it's time to wake up to this. It's really time to wake up to this. The question is, how do we use it uh, in a profitable way? Anyway, that's... Uh, uh, I have a question. I mean, I'm, I'm going to just make an opening question and then uh, waiting for the students to, to leave their comments on the, um, the Q&A area. Uh, my question is, you know, uh, years ago, uh, I, I was stopped by you and I was all this interested about the robotic fabrication, which, which is happening. Uh, computational design and suddenly I come to Latin America and I see how even if it's accessible the technology you, you can have the robotic arm you, you can have the school or the industry but it's not happening it's not happening because there is no maybe an educational system but even if someone learns there is no demand for such application so what do you think it could happen the same for AI, even if it's gonna be accessible, maybe it's not gonna be applied because the market will not ask for it, at least well, in Latin America. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, but 
does the market need to ask for it? I mean, when you, I was shocked when Gmail started telling me how to finish my sentences. I was shocked by that. I didn't ask for that, but it just, Google introduced this thing. And, and even the, years and years ago, I was shocked by spell check, but we need spell check, right? And so it, it's, it's an interesting question. I was a student in Cambridge in England in the 1980s, right? That's when computation came. And all my professors said, oh, no, we cannot use computers in the studio. No. Um, and what they produced was basically a generation of graduates who were unemployable. You needed to use the computer. So the real challenge for educators, and often it's, it's, it's difficult. Educators were maybe, they studied, I don't know, Luca Guzia 30 years ago um, to keep up with this world. And the world is changing really quickly. It's changing exponentially. Almost every week, there's some new development. So we need to wake up to it. And, and it, it will be universal, I think, anyway. So, um, uh, but you're right. It, maybe it's not going to be completely um, evenly spread. Um, the future is already here, but it's not evenly spread. I think that's one of the expressions someone said. Um, so maybe more New York and London first, but eventually everybody will be affected by this. Um, we all use AI. We may not realize it. We all use AI right now on our phones. Correct. Look, I'm going to start uh, reading some questions, or sure. I don't know if you prefer you uh, yourself, or but the first one is, well, what's your inspiration? Inspiration. Uh, you know, I went to school, I went to architecture, it's like the 80s, right? And I, I had been inspired by the Sydney Opera House. I thought, wow, let's go. And, and we got postmodernism in the 80s, right? I would say that, you know, uh, Zaha was my inspiration. Um, uh, uh, when I, I, it, she appeared in the late eighties, and I thought that's what I was looking for. That was what I was looking for. And I think in the late eighties, uh, early nineties, we had an amazing moment in architecture. It was, it was not only with this new design; it was also computation, and it was also theory. You know, we had this Derrida, Deleuze, and all these theorists coming out, and now. Actually, it's a very similar moment. We've got some new designs coming out. Um, AI is, 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 is the new generator. And we also have this incredible theoretical debate with neuroscience, which incredible ideas are coming out. So I'm just inspired by people from other fields, especially neuroscientists who are coming up with crazy ideas about how we operate. You know, some of the theorists think that we live in a simulation, these neuroscientists. Some of the people say that we, and Il Seth says that we, we, our perception of reality is a controlled hallucination. I mean, that's incredible. We're hallucinating things. So I'm always looking from outside to the new tools and also the new ideas. So um, yeah, I'm inspired by this. I've got to say, I've never been so excited in my entire career as what's happening now. I think it's an incredible moment for architecture. Great, great. I, I think it's important to, to show them at least how, um, how to find the journey at least. Um, the, the yeah, well, I, I, what I would say is the mid journey is quite straightforward. You can just find it, Google it, and things. And it is so easy to use. What you do basically, you put in a prompt and you describe it. Now, what you when you just when you, the words you've got to include words like hyper realistic, super detailed, those kind of things, um, in order to get and render. You've got to put a rendering engine in there to make it good. But you produce the, the you put in this, this text, and then four images come out, and you decide. Um, I'm going to enlarge this one, or I'm going to uh, diff, uh, uh, come up with different options, different variations of this one. And so you take it in different directions. Um, it's a bit like teaching. You can't control a student. You can't control this, but you can at least encourage it to go in some direction. And after about 25 iterations, it's a long, it's, you know, 25 is maybe two hours, eventually something amazing will come out. But then we do have on the, the Digital digital Futures channel a lot of, of um uh, of, of, of tutorials, a lot of uh, discussions about Mid Journey and Valley. Um, we have every Sunday we're having a session um, um, on 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 di digital futures. So if maybe you could just put the digital futures um, YouTube link in there, they could see that. Um, we also have you know workshops in the summer about this. Um, we had twenty or th thirty this last summer on on AI. Um, you don't really need a workshop actually because you teach yourself, but but it, it's it's very straightforward. Um, so I would encourage you to at least try. It, at the first, it's unsophisticated, but as you get to understand the tool, you can make it more sophisticated. All right. 
<clears throat> look we have um sabine stratman uh, say that would be fun if there was a 3d model program when one could manipulate the ai generated image perhaps yeah. it already exists yeah let me just say that i think the two areas where things are beginning to develop are that in the sense that we um people are connecting now to grasshopper that that's relatively new i think it was two days ago but they're connecting it to grasshopper so you can three-dimensionalize it the problem is these images are just two-dimensional images so that's an important step the other question i think that people are doing is is i mean when photography first came around you know, did it replace painting not really but it produced another art form so my suspicion is that mid journeys producing another art form um another form of expression and what i find interesting I, i'm trained as an architect i i i'm qualified as an architect but i've been a theorist and i haven't been paying attention shall we say to all these technologies but it allows me to go and do these things so there is new breed of kind of theorist designers that are appearing it's kind of interesting um but you know, I think I think I, it, there's so much out there on the internet. But I would have a look at digital futures because we have many many sessions with some really good people showing you what you can do. And also, I would say look at Instagram. Great. Neil, next, uh, Marcelo is asking, uh, can you use AI to create actual things such as having a list of materials, blueprints, um, etc., used in in that design? Yeah, that, that's a really good question, actually. It's a really good question. In fact, I mean, AI is, is code. It's immaterial. It's actually immaterial. And if you think about it, even with a CNC machine, right, the actual drilling, that's analog. I mean, you're controlling, and that's what CNC means, computer numerically controlled. You're controlling the drill with, a, with the computer, but the drilling is analog. And actually, AI can't do, do anything. All you can do is control certain things. So you control, um, when you're 3D printing, the deposition. You, you can control the materials coming out of the nozzle, but it's not physical. And therefore, you can't build things. They are actually now using it now um, to stack Lego bricks. And that's that's actually not very, it's not very easy with AI because we do it naturally, but it's very, very hard to train AI to do this. Um, but no, it, it, it doesn't actually fabricate things, but you could, can control a robot. You can control um, uh, 3D printers and so on through it, but you can't actually use AI to build. Um, yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think it, I think it was really well answered. <clears throat> then we have um, Andres, uh, used to be a fan of you, following digital futures, lectures, workshops. <laughs> Andres is a really good friend of mine, and he's asking um, if you really think uh, it will become a death of the architects and, uh, and AI will be completely autonomous, or instead of uh, is not more a transformation of the creative power of the designer and the architect as the director the, uh, with the assistant of AI. Well, you know, I don't think we're so creative. We think we're creative, right? But frankly, in architecture, we I mean, there's a canon of architecture. You've got to sort of, as a student, you have to produce a design a bit like Zaha, a bit like Norman Foster, a bit like Rem Kulas. Uh, if you do something crazy, it's not architecture. So we tend to be a bit conventional. And even if you get someone like Frank Gehry who does something new, he copies himself, right? So the LA Philharmonic looks just like the Bilbao mu Museum. I'm not so sure that we are so uh, creative. And I think this is what, what, is what um, uh, Mid Journey shows. Somebody using mid-journey is better than someone not using mid-journey. We're not that capable. So, um, uh, uh, so what was the, so what the question again was? Just re repeat the first part of it. Sorry. Um, would would if, it be if we will be the director of the project and AI will be an assistant, or it will be the death of the architect? Yeah. So, <laughs> let me just say one thing. I, I started working on my book. Um, and I found myself compromised because I was both saying this is amazing and this is terrifying. So then I went back to my publishers, um, Bloomsbury in London. They, they produced the Harry Potter books. And I said, can I do two books? One with a white cover about how positive it is and one with a black cover about how the dark side of AI, the kind of black mirror side of AI. 
And so the Black Mirror is going to be called the death of the architect, right? Um, and it's not that AI itself is going to do that, right? My point is that architects are already struggling. They're already struggling. So the definition of an architect that we have from Alberti, and I know because I translated Alberti, the idea of the architect being in charge and so on, that's already gone. We are not in charge. In most contracts, building contracts in the UK, uh, the, it's the design build, and the architect is working for a developer. In other words, the architect is no longer in charge. We're already we're already losing out. Only five percent of buildings are designed by architects anyway. And my point is that we're all, we're losing, we're losing, we're losing. And AI could well be the final uh, nail in in the coffin, as it were. And um, so I haven't written the final book yet, but I I know the final sentence because I start with Alberti and then I finish with AI. But curiously, Alberti's name begins with A and ends in I. But my prediction is that basically we are going to struggle like crazy when AI comes in because AI is cheaper. Which client is going to pay for an architect to, and wait for, 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 for weeks, months for a design when you can do something with AI almost for free and instantaneously? So we have to wake up to that. We have to be, I'm not sure what the answer is, but what I would say is that if you're aware of the problem, it's a different kind of problem. It's a problem you can start thinking about rather than a problem by which you are trapped. So my, 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 my comment today is, wake up, guys. We need to be aware of this. This is something we can either exploit or something that's going to really uh, destroy architecture. So, you know, I think there are possibilities out there, but it, it's, it is dangerous. I mean, so um, I, I personally think there will still be humans in the loop. Um, but we need to be able to exploit these systems to really work effectively in this new uh, working landscape. Okay, for, for a second, you say destroy architecture. Yeah, well, I mean, this what architecture uh, as a discipline, uh, as a discipline or as a, as a profession. Okay, okay, okay. okay, um, okay. I mean, one, one thing I also will say is that, you know, I think architects are really, one thing we don't take into account is the fact that the training of the architect is incredible. You know, we are the only ones who know how to design, who think three dimension, who can understand material behavior and so on. And what I've discovered is that actually in the, here in LA, there are many architects who, 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 who they train as architects and they move into the space industry. They're making movies for Hollywood and so on and so on. There's a lot of different domains. And I think we have to be creative. We have to put up, use our imagination to think how those skills, the skill set we have, which is very marketable, can be deployed elsewhere because it's going to be tough in the future. And the people who are resourceful, the people who can imagine other possibilities are the ones who are going to survive. All right. <laughs> okay. I mean, just one thing I would say that, you know, um, put yourself back about a about hundred years ago or so um, when, when Henry Ford was producing the Model T Ford. Um, no, there were horses, right? And there were, there, were, there, were, there were horses and carriage and the car comes along. Um, and of course, all the horses, they're out of work as soon as the car comes along. But the comment that, that Henry Ford made, which I think is a really important one, he said, if I'd asked people what they wanted, they would say faster horses. We need to change our mindset. It's not better architects, but a different way of working entirely. And we've got to think like Elon Musk. You know, it, it's, that's the only way we can survive. Okay. Okay, let's go to the next. We have Miguel. What's your, what are your thoughts about copyright? Do you believe there has to be a limit about how, can, how AI can copy the style of a specific artist, designer? Or do you think it's fair game or is justified as inspiration only? Yeah, this is a good question. Um, I, I personally, I wrote an essay called The Culture of the Copy. There was an issue of architectural design that was worried about copyright. And my point is we copy everyone the whole time. That's how culture operates. You know? If someone's playing a tune, we play it. If someone has a baseball cap, we buy the same baseball cap, we wear it. We, cop we culture uh, develops through copying and architecture's frankly copying, right? We, we're taught how to do something a bit like Zaha. So I don't think that we're, we're so original anyway, but I think the point is that, 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 that um, and, and you, you think about little things like how kid, you know, plays doctors and nurses, or I don't know, um, those kind of games. We're copying things. We're copying what a doctor would do. What a, so we're always already copying. So I, I think it's endemic to, to people. If you think about it, it's a bit like collage, you know? Um, 
collage is not copying, but you're taking bit of samples and things. So I don't think that, um, I mean, it, it is a gray area in terms of the law. There's no law on it just yet. There, there are different laws in different, in different countries. And I spoke about this in my, in my book. Um, uh, so it's, it's, a, it's a bit of a gray area, but I don't think, I don't think that um, you can claim copyright. At the moment, only humans can, can claim copyright, not, not machines. So it's a bit, it is, it is a, it's a tricky area. I mean, the other area I'd say that is also a bit suspect is people are worried about how AI is biased, you know, that it keeps doing certain things. But my point would be, it gets its bias from us. I mean, it's, it's, it's using data that is biased because we're biased as people. So I, I don't think, I don't think that AI is evil, but it's, it's very capable that no tool is evil. I mean, you can use a kitchen knife and you can cut up your vegetables or you can murder something. There's nothing evil about AI, but it's just terrifying what it can do. Um, yeah. Hmm. Okay. Well, next, um, there are some questions which are similar about uh, AI as a tool. Um, In the age of AI, what kind of decision will the new architects are going to make? Mm, I think it's something we, we already talked about. I guess, I mean, the, the point about the, you know, initially, these tools are going to be really helpful. I mean, so helpful, like spell check, you know, just really useful, helpful. And, and you can imagine small offices, you can imagine theorists like myself entering a competition, right? And doing an entire city, you know, in the space of two hours being front of it. Um, but eventually it's going to be a little bit tricky when, when everyone's doing that and the competition gets, gets high. And when, when clients realize that, uh, that, that, that they, can, they can do it themselves almost. Um, one thing I did find out, I mean, just, I wanted to go back to, I didn't, I, I took the slides out, but maybe I shouldn't have done it. But the story of AlphaGo, where AlphaGo produced certain uh, uh, strategies or certain moves that nobody could understand, the same things happened already with AI, that, that AI can become up with solutions, especially to urban planning problems that nobody would have thought about. Um, so that's, that's the point, is, is that we, we can't imagine it's better than us, but it is, right? Um, yeah. Okay. That's actually really interesting when you say that about the urban because it, it means, I mean, we are not thinking about the, 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 the utility of what can happen with this, with this tool. Yeah, no, I think that an architecture typically is made up of both appearances, aesthetics, right? And function, what it does. Mm -hmm. And there's a logical side, a strategic side to it. So if you think about planning, the planning side is a bit like playing chess or go. You've got to think strategically. But there's also the aesthetics, which is another question entirely. And, and you say, oh, well, it, maybe it can play get chess and go, and it's good at that, but it can't design. But my point would be that already AI knows what news we like, because the bots in our phone, on, our, on, on the internet, they are giving us the news we want. It knows what books we like. Amazon's telling us the books we want. It knows what music we want. Um, Spotify does that. So very soon it will be able to understand what we want in terms of our designs and give us that as well. So you can just predict these things. They, they, they're going to happen fairly soon. You, you know what I will be interesting to see? When, when we are used to, to have bad critics about architects, like, you know, he, he did this, it doesn't work. Uh, it's amazing design, but doesn't, it's not functional. Or it's too expensive. I think it will be interesting to, when, when we have a good proposal by AI, start criticizing and understand, like, if it's about style, if it's about function, or if it's about a third thing that we are not imagining yet. Yeah, I mean, to my mind, the blind spot of architects is, 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 is money, right? I mean, if you look at any book on architecture, there's no reference to cost, apart from the price of the book on the back cover. But you talk to a client, that's what they're obsessed by. You know, they'll say, well, how much does it cost? And people say, oh, don't worry about the cost. It looking like a beautiful build. But that's the point, and I think, what, this is going to be probably the most important area. You can you can control the cost. You can monitor the cost, and 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 clients are going to be obsessed by that. And of course, also the cost of the architect as well has been part of that thing. So once it can do these things and it can perform, um, uh, uh, that's the point. And just to sort of say another comment I, that I picked up in my research, I didn't mention today, is that um, uh, the the CEO of SpaceMaker, which is one of the early uh, AI firms said that clients already asking their architects to use AI. 
Why are they asking the, their architects to use AI? Because it guarantees the return on investment. It guarantees they get the maximum profit from their site. And that's what they're gonna be assessed about. So in a way, no matter how sophisticated the technology, the main concern that people want is to get it as cheap as possible and to make as much profit from things. And you can't avoid that. That's gonna be the case. And, and of course, it's going to be good when you can you can have it performing um, when it, when it it's, 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 uh, performs in terms of the, the heating and so on and acoustics and structure. But this will be all be written into the into the AI, so it will automatically conform to those requirements and conform to planning and control and so on. As I mentioned my, my talk. All right. Okay. Okay. Close. Um. Next. Next question. Um. They're asking if you are familiar with the work of Constantina Psoma and um, her project, Kaidim. It's something similar to, to Big Journey, you, but it can produce 3D, uh, 3D objects instead of images. Yeah, I mean, um, that's been, I, I'm not actually, but there's been a lot of research into that. And uh, again, I've got the section in my book talking about this. I mean, the first one was PyTorch 3D, which was a system that was very crude, but that was trying to do it in 3D. I mean, the problem is that there are lots of problems as to why we have we've gotten to 3D. I, I don't know this particular system, but I think what's happening already is that people are I mean, just connecting with Grasshopper immediately make, makes it 3D. So it's those kind of things which I think are going to be the um, the way forward so it's not going to be i don't think it's going to be straight ai that is going to give us the 3d it's going to be ai plus grasshopper ai with something else but what is interesting is the inventive way with which people play with these tools um, i mean you can all you can do is develop the tool but what people do with the tool is another question um and and that that's been the exciting thing as i've seen so much invention in what people are doing with these things by combining them with other tools uh, so i don't know that particular software but that is clearly the key issue, um, absolutely, yeah. All right. And could uh, could AI create a good story? Yes. Oh God, God. So let me just tell you this, and this was a shock to me. This was my shock of, of I think, two weeks ago. So I I teach a course on the theory of AI, um, and uh, well, it was initially it was just the theory of digital, right? And, but everyone was writing about AI because the, the current generation. These are the AI generation. And I was getting these essays three years ago, and I thought, this is very suspicious. They're all such good essays. Are they using AI to generate the essay, right? Are they using it? Well, two weeks ago, I got an essay. I got a video, actually, um, from one of my students um, uh, at, at Florida International University. He had used three types of AI. He'd started off by using one AI that could produce a narrative. And, and this is what GPT-3 can do. It can produce text that is really convincing. And in fact, that was the reason why Elon Musk stopped uh, investing in open AI, because he was terrified what he saw coming out. It can produce text. So he had a first software where he used, uh, like mid-journey, but instead of creating images, you create text. He produced this really incredible text. And then um, uh, he had a second AI that was able to take that text and uh, and use a human voice to, to speak. So he was able to use that. And then thirdly, he used a version of, of I'm not sure if it was Mid Journey or Dali, to look at the text and to, draw, to make images based on the text. So there were three AIs. And that was astonishing enough in itself. But what was the strange thing? And it, the, I got this uh, submission right before Halloween. <laughs> the AI came up with this comment saying, well, the real problem about the about the, the the earth these days are human beings because we are polluting the world. We need to get rid of human beings. This is really a kind of a Halloween kind of thing. So yeah, I mean the big challenge in in two years, in one year time, in one year's time, even less, maybe a few months, we will get essays that are completely generated by AI, and you won't be able to tell. You will not be able to tell. In fact, there's one book um, about AI and creativity, and you're reading it. And you finish one chapter and the guy says, oh, by the way, that chapter was written by AI. So, yeah, I mean, 
it's going to be a, it's going to, I don't know what we're going to do. I mean, we have to accept the fact it's going to be written by AI. Maybe we we ask our students to say, well, use AI to generate an article or something. So we already accept the fact it's going to do that. But um, it's going to do that. And of course, it's doing that in this design studio. And most of the professors in, in many schools are completely unaware of this. And, you know, I could produce some of those things I showed you, which I did in a few minutes. And I would probably get a, an A grade for it. But, you know, it was done by mid-journey. So... There's a new, there's a new paradigm that's out there, um, and yes, it can write better text than us, better text than us. Okay, Neil, can you can you recommend three books? I think you already shared it, but yeah, I would say um, okay. So in general terms, the two good books I I I, um, I had I showed you Margaret Bowden's book. That's an introductory one. That doesn't tell you about architecture. It tells you about AI. And also Melanie Mitchell. Melanie Mitchell has got a book, uh, A Thinking Person's Guide to AI, that's really good, really well written. But it's not about design. In fact, it doesn't even mention images, but, you know, it, it's uh, it's very good. I would say right now that, I mean, okay, so all these books came out this year. And the problem is that they're all out of date. I mean, not least because Mid Journey appeared and all the images that we produce now are really um, uh, 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 are much better than what we put in those books. And I'm trying to persuade my publishers to do a second edition. Can we replace all these images? Because we need to. In fact, I now have a Chinese translation of my first book, Architecture in the Age of AI, coming out. And I've completely changed the images, completely changed the images. So um, uh, I, I don't know. There are several out there at the moment. Um, and I had them on one of my slides. I put, I showed you all those things. I think that possibly there'll be a new generation coming out soon. I'm working on one with Wan Yu Ho and Daniel Bollinger um, uh, called the AI Design Revolution that will have some of these new images. But, you know, actually the big question is really whether books are, are can even keep pace with these changes. Um, so in technology, there's this concept of Moore's law where things change exponentially. They get faster and faster. And that's the problem. When you submit a manuscript for a book, it comes out 12 months later and in 12 months the world has changed completely so i'm not even sure that books are the places to go i would say i mean it's nice to have books of course but i would say that some of the podcasts are the most important ones and i i, I would recommend the digital futures um podcast we've got a whole series of these things and they're really up to date so maybe better than, than the books although i'd recommend my book <laughs> but i and the interesting thing about my book is i don't really i talk about the past and the future and I don't talk much about the present. Um, and I think all the books that talk about the present are all out of date. So um, I don't know. Um, let's just see. But um, uh, I would say I'd say digital futures is the place to go if you want information right now, um, because it's so immediate. Great, Neil. I, I think we have one last question, also because we extended half an hour longer than the, than the plan. Um, but really, thank you very much. The last question is about if AI can have an op opinions. Yes. Yes, that's a good one. That's a good one. That, so let me just say, I don't know if anyone was, I mentioned it in the talk, but there was a very famous moment um, this summer when, um, I forget his name, um, there was a Google engineer who thought that AI was conscious. He was working with Lambda. Lambda is the Google conversation on AI. And he was convinced that it was it was it was aware, self-aware, it's sentient. Um, now, um, but it's not. Uh, and you know, I think the danger is it gives the appearance of understanding things. It gives the appearance of understanding structure, but it doesn't. You no. Know? Um, so AI cannot have an opinion until it can think. So just that, that I showed that video of that interview, and AI was lying. Well. I mean, it isn't sentient. It's not self-aware, but but GPT-3 was claiming it was. Well, it's not. But um, so you can get the impression from that video that 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 character, that GPT-3, was was had an opinion and and, and would think, but it, it can't. It's just an appearance of things. It's just taking everything from the internet. What do people say? What they do on the internet? Um, and it, it's not thinking about it. Having said that, there are a lot of things that we do which we don't really think about. Um, you know, if you go to Japan and everyone nods, bows at you, start bowing back automatically. So some things we do are not really, um, we don't really, we're not aware of it. We're not completely conscious. In fact, you could even say that when you have this kind of 
light bulb moment. You think of an idea. Actually, we're not aware of it. We just, it comes, it erupts. And afterwards, we think, oh, that was a good idea. But we're not really aware of the process. So anyway, AI cannot have an opinion right now. Um, it can look as though it has an opinion, but it doesn't have an opinion. It doesn't think. And this is an important thing. AI has no more capacity to think than your pocket calculator or your toaster. You know, Does it need to think? Well, if your toaster can produce good toast, no. And I don't think that it does. In fact, there is a comment that's made by the uh, Israeli historian Yuval Harari, who says, well, he says that, well, first thing he says, that there are many routes to uh, super intelligence, not all of them passing through the straits of consciousness. In other words, you don't have to be conscious. But not only that, he says, maybe consciousness is a problem. So he takes the example of a, of a car, a Google car, where a human driver crashed into, the, into, into, the, into oh the Google car. Now, we know, of course, that Google cars have crashed, of course, and they're still having problems, but they will resolve those problems. Uh, and the point is that human beings will always be distracted. And I don't know why that person crashed. Maybe they were checking their phones or I don't know what, but they crashed. So uh, <clears throat> self-driving cars will get better and better and humans will always be distracted. So um, maybe we don't need consciousness. I don't think we need consciousness. There's a lot of big argument. Oh, when will computers be conscious? Why do we need them to be conscious? As long as they do what they do, when they produce things that are useful, they don't need to be conscious. But no, AI doesn't have an opinion. I mean, it might look like it does, and we can be, be, be deceived by it, but no, it doesn't. Well, Neil, thank you. Thank you really very much. I think, wow, no? Uh, the knowledge you are acquiring and sharing is unique, and I hope all the students enjoyed. I it was a one one and a half uh, hour lecture, unique, um, and I hope I hope to invite you also next semester because I believe in a couple of months you are going to have new material. Uh, as you said, it's going to be you now producing things every, every minute. So I'm, I'm I'm always happy to come to Mexico, which. Um, which uh, uh, I mean, Mexico is such an incredible culture. I mean, I've got to say, you know, I mean, coming from Europe, I find America a bit banal, but Mexico has got such a rich culture, such good food and whatever. You know, I, I love it in Mexico. So, no. Um, but yes, things are changing. Things are changing. You know, uh, I, I have to change my lecture every single week, every single day almost, because every single day something's happening. And it's... it's um, It's kind of terrifying, actually, but uh, uh, yeah. So all I was trying to do today was really to provide information, just straightforward information. What is AI? Where did it come from? How does it generate images? But there'll be more, and it'll be changing every day, and uh, the world will never be the same. So you no, know, I think we are we are planners, we are designers, and we have to design our own future. We have to plan our own future in the, in the age of AI and try and see how we can make the world a better place. But that's the real challenge not designing buildings designing the future of architecture especially for educators and especially for the students those who are students now who will be at the peak of their career when ai kicks in the office will be a completely different place in three to five years time no bid it will be it'll be completely different so um uh, it, this is meant to be a wake-up call if it shocked you then i've succeeded in, in in doing what i wanted to do it's uh um yeah so And let's, say, me. let's say better than terrifying, let's say exciting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exhilarating. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you, Neil. Thank you, Jordi. Um, and uh, yeah, I hope it was helpful. Thank you. Greatly. We are going to plan uh, how to, to, to get you here in Mexico next semester. Thank you. Great. Good. Um, well, and let's just see. The world will have changed by next semester for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, everyone. That's it. Got it. In touch. Bye. Bye. -bye.